I'm going to go ahead and get started in introducing our keynote. And um, I think that this is going to be a really interesting uh, discussion following on our very interesting uh, keynote with Vicki Patton this morning and panel uh, looking at the Clean Power Plan, the Clean Air Act, and other ways to reduce emissions, um, as well as citizen suits and other uh, legal tools that are in the toolbox, so to speak. Um, Michael Berger is going to share with us a complementary approach uh, I think it's fair to say to the Clean Power Plan under a different provision of the Clean Air Act that you might not have studied yet. It's not a very long one, isn't, hasn't been used a lot of times, but it's Section 115. Um, and I want to start before I uh, introduce Michael and tell you a little bit about his background by saying that, um, you know, there aren't that many climate centers at law schools. And the one at Columbia started around the same time that, um, that we started here uh, with Mike Gerard, another Mike who works with Michael. And he's been really a terrific colleague. Um, they do quite different things, although it's very complementary. Um, they have a really terrific database on litigation that you can use as a, as a resource. They've done work on international adaptation, working with some of the small island states that are, you know, literally, you know, sinking as sea levels rise and um, what's going to happen to potentially, you know, massively displaced people and uh, the, the problem of climate refugees and so many other issues that uh, we really respect and admire. And uh, Mike Gerard and I also, for, for many years now, and our teams, including Kate Sila, our deputy director who's here, um, have been hosting now for the last several years um, dinners for the various climate and energy centers popping up around different law schools around the country, because there are more and more all the time uh, who are doing this kind of th work. Um, and every year around the American Association of Law Schools meeting, uh, we co-host a dinner. And uh, that's been a really great opportunity to compare notes and to make sure that people are, um, you know, just doing complimentary work and, uh, you know, supporting each other and um, and learning from each other, frankly. Um, so, and, and, and Michael Gerard brought in Michael Berger, who's here with us today, to serve as executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia, where he's also a research scholar and lecturer in law. So now I'm just going to say a few words about Michael. I know that there are also bios in the program for those of you who aren't listening online. Um, Michael's current research and advocacy focus is on domestic and international efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to promote adaptation through pollution control, natural resources management, land use planning, and green finance. In his role as executive director, he's consulted with international organizations, including the United Nations Environment Program, the UN Development Program, and the International Red Cross. And he's collaborated with local and national environmental groups, government representatives, and scientists at the Earth Institute at Columbia to advance climate action. He serves as lead counsel for an amicus coalition, including the US Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities and Cities and Counties nationwide in support of the Clean Power Plan. So thank you for that. And thank you for taking your time at this very busy time to do this. Um, he's the coordinating lead author of the report, Legal Pathways to Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emissions under Section 115 of the Clean Air Act, which he'll be speaking about today. So without further ado, Michael. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Vicki, for that introduction. Um, and I'd like to begin with a word of thanks to this morning's panel uh, for their very thoughtful and creative presentations. Uh, and a quick congratulations to the organizers um, for this event, for conceiving of this, organizing it, and finally pulling it off. In our current political climate, where Congress tries repeatedly to undo existing environmental laws and utterly neglects the pressing need to pass new ones, where popular support for environmental protection is lost in the chasm of our government's growing partisan divide, the demand for legal and regulatory innovation has never been greater. Today, I will argue that Section 115 of the Clean Air Act, that EPA can use this section to address climate change. Section 115 is titled International Air Pollution. And this is good for my argument because climate change is without question an international air pollution problem. Section 115, however, has never been implemented before in any context. This is probably bad for my argument because it raises a sneaking suspicion. Why not? I'll come back to that. So the analysis and approach that I'm going to outline today is spelled out in greater detail in a report presently published on the Sabin Center's website and forthcoming in the symposium issue of the Georgetown Environmental Law Review. 
The essence of the argument is this. First, Section 115 authorizes EPA to require states to address emissions that contribute to air pollution endangering public health or welfare in foreign countries if the other countries provide the US with reciprocal protections. Second, the language of the provision does not limit the agency to regulating a particular source type or a given industrial or economic sector. Rather, it grants EPA and the state's broad latitude to address international air pollution through the state implementation plan or SIP process. Third, EPA and the states can use this provision to establish an economy-wide cross-sectoral greenhouse gas emissions trading program that incorporates both stationary and mobile sources. In so doing, it could provide one of the most effective and efficient means available to address climate change pollution in the United States. Now, based on the questions that I heard from the students in the room this morning, um, it seems like most people here are well familiar with the basic fact of climate change. Emissions of a number of gases, including green, uh, carbon dioxide, are enhancing the atmosphere's greenhouse effect. Uh, and as a consequence, the planet is warming. The indicators of global warming are everywhere. Glaciers are melting, snow cover is disappearing, the sea ice is retreating in both thickness and extent. Meanwhile, land temperatures, ocean temperatures, tropospheric temperatures and humidity are all increasing. And tree lines and species are migrating poleward and upward um, beyond their historic ranges. In addition, the ocean is becoming more acid. And this is, has significant implications for coral reefs, marine wildlife and habitats, and drinking water supplies. So according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, there is high confidence that these changing conditions are caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. The atmosphere in the period since the onset of the Industrial Revolution has achieved levels of carbon dioxide not seen on planet Earth in at least 800,000 years. These atmospheric concentrations correspond to the unprecedented increase in global temperatures that we, that we have seen. We are now beyond temperatures previously experienced in the course of human civilization. And the rate of increase is remarkable. Two degrees of warming, the target limit adopted by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is far outside the norm. And the temperatures that we are likely to see if we continue along a business as usual trajectory are literally off the chart. The consequences of our actions are and will be extraordinary. This slide depicts four primary areas of climate four primary areas of climate change impacts. Food supplies and food security, freshwater resources and sea level rise, ecosystem degradation and species extinction, and extreme weather events and radical climatic transformation. At one degree Celsius, which is where we already are, we are seeing issues with regard to water, ecosystems, and extreme events, among other things. At two degrees C, we will see falling crop yields in developing countries, the disappearance of even more glaciers, the near total bleaching of coral reefs, and ever increasing intensity and frequency of extreme events like storms, droughts, forest fires, and heat waves. Excuse me. Beyond two degrees, things get far worse. Falling yields everywhere, significant loss of water resources, the inundation of coastal cities and regions, mass species extinction, and the potential for the world to become so hot and severe that it is essentially unrecognizable to us. In places, it will be utterly unfit for human habitation. So with that cheery news, we move on to what's going on. Under the Obama administration, the United States has transformed from a climate laggard to a climate leader on the international stage. In the wake of the Supreme Court's 2007 decision in Mass versus EPA, and in the absence of congressional action, the Clean Air Act has become the federal government's primary tool for addressing greenhouse gas emissions. In a gross oversimplification, the act regulates within and between the states um, by pollutant type, by source type, and by compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs. However, as everyone acknowledges, the Clean Air Act is not the most desirable structure to work with. Among other shortcomings, the bulk of the statute is designed to address local and regional air quality problems, not to coordinate with international efforts 
to address global problems like climate change. Its health-based and technology-based standards are not tailored to greenhouse gas emissions, and they do not send a clear price signal uh, on carbon. And it does not, on its face, address land use changes or the role of sinks. Nonetheless, in Mass versus EPA, the Supreme Court held that the greenhouse gases are air pollutants covered by the Clean Air Act, and that EPA must determine whether or not emissions from new motor vehicles endanger public health or welfare. In December 2009, EPA issued its endangerment finding. Now, the finding and the issuance of standards to, con to control greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles set in motion EPA's regulation of greenhouse gases from stationary sources. As you can see here, EPA's regulations have proceeded along two streams, and we've been talking about these two streams all day. The regulation of stationary sources under the Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program, or PSD, and the regulation of sta stationary sources under the New Source Performance Standards and the Clean Power Plan for existing sources. Each one of these regulations has been the subject of legal challenges by states and industry. The challenges to the PSD provisions led to the Supreme Court's 2014 decision in Utility Air, Reg Utility Air Regulatory Group versus EPA. In that case, the court addressed the question of whether the regulation of greenhouse gases from mobile sources triggered regulation of st stationary sources. The court held, in brief, that the act did not require such regulation, that it did permit EPA to regulate some stationary sources, those that already were in the PSD program, and that it did not permit EPA to re regulate others, the smaller sources that were outside the program. <coughs> Now, the challenges to the new source performance standards and the Clean Power Plan are moving through the courts now. Challenges to the new source performance standards focus on whether carbon capture and sequestration technology has been adequately demonstrated. And then, as we've heard uh, earlier from our panelists, the Clean Power Plan uh, litigation focuses on a broader set of issues. Just to summarize quickly what's going on with the Clean Power Plan, because I know a lot of you are very familiar with it, um, EPA is seeking to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants, the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. To do so, it has developed uniform emissions rates for coal-fired and gas-fired power plants based on the building blocks approach um, that you've probably heard of already. This is projected to reduce emissions from these plants by 32% from 2005 levels by 2030. This is much different than what we will see in the absence of the Clean Power Plan. In that scenario, uh, emissions are projected to remain essentially constant with a slight increase. The difference between the Clean Power Plan and the non-Clean Power Plan scenarios or trajectories is easily explained. With a Clean Power Plan, coal-fired power plants will retire and wind and solar energy will dramatically increase. Without it, they won't. Now, with the Supreme Court stay in place, we're not going to know the fate of the Clean Power Plan for quite some time. In addition to these uh, initiatives, EPA has undertaken a number of other regulatory initiatives that are at various stages of development, including the landfill air pollution standards, oil and gas uh, air pollution standards, fuel efficiency standards for uh, heavy vehicles, and hydrofluorocarbon regulations under the Montreal Protocol. All of this taken together is not enough to get us to where we need to be. So let's take a step back for a moment and look at U.S. climate action in the international context. In December, all 195 members of the UNFCCC reached consensus and adopted the Paris Agreement. As part of the process leading up to that meeting, the countries submitted emissions pledges named the, internally de the Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, or INDCs. This chart illustrates the difference between where we are which is um, in the, at the top of the blue line there, what the INDCs would do, which is the red line going down, and where we need to be in order to satisfy the 2 degree and 1.5 degree targets. Current policies in place around the world have us on a trajectory to a 3 to 4 degrees Celsius of 
uh, global warming. The INDCs put us on the trajectory towards 2.4 to 2.7 degrees Celsius. That is still not enough to achieve the two degree goal and is far from the 1.5 or well below two degree goals that were adopted in the Paris Agreement as more ambitious targets. So greenhouse gas emissions in the United States have been on a downward slope in recent years. And as this chart indicates, the US may be on a pathway to meet the previous pledge it had made of a 17% reduction from 2005 levels by 2020. However, this, this, in its INDC, the US pledged to reduce emissions by 26 to 28% as compared with 2005 by 2025. We will need a sharp and sudden decrease in emissions to achieve that goal. Can we do it? Is, a, is the obvious question. Earlier this year, the US Department of State submitted its second biennial report to the UNFCCC. This describes the actions that the government has undertaken and intends to undertake to address climate change. So this figure is a little bit detailed and it's a little small perhaps from where, from where you're sitting, uh, but it shows the government's view of what's possible. And there's a lot going on here, but there's one key takeaway point that I could summarize, which is that by the federal government's own calculations, existing regulations, including the Clean Power Plan and new energy efficiency standards, even in the most optimistic projection, are projected to only take us to around 17% below 2005 levels by 2025. Another analysis issued by the Rhodium Group earlier this year paints an even more alarming picture. According to this analysis, with all current and proposed regulations added in, meaning the Clean Power Plan, the Energy Efficiency Standards, and those other provisions and a few others that I mentioned earlier today that are still in the proposal phase and have not yet been finalized, and again, under the most optimistic scenarios, we are still only at 23% reductions, leaving us with a three to 5% emissions gap. Moreover, as I mentioned before, the current slate of INDCs, including the US INDC, do not bring us to the two degree target. We're overshooting. Looking into the future, the US and other nations will need to not only maintain emissions reductions that are already achieved, but will also need to reduce emissions in a far more drastic fashion than what we're looking at over the next seven to 10 years. If we are to avoid the very worst impacts of climate change. The current regulatory regime does not give us a clear pathway to this increased mitigation ambition or to the ultimate end of deep decarbonization. Section 115 of the Clean Air Act may offer us a solution. Section 115 provides a regulatory mechanism through which the United States can more effectively and more efficiently fill in that emissions gap and achieve the emissions reductions committed to in the US INDC. In addition, because it can explicitly be tied to the international commitments that are, have been made and will be made through the UNFCCC, it also provides an on-ramp to increased mitigation ambition. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at what the statute says. Section 115A provides for an endangerment finding. It states that whenever the administrator, upon receipt of res reports from any duly constituted international body, determines that an air pollutant causes or contributes to pollution that endangers the public health or welfare in a foreign country, the administrator will notify the governor of the state in which the sources of the air pollutant exist. So again, this is the provision that requires an endangerment finding be made. Section 115B provides that this notice serves as a SIP call, requiring revision of the state's state implementation plan to prevent or eliminate the endangerment. This establishes both the mechanism for implementation, use of the SIP process, and the standard for pollution control, prevention or elimination. In addition, the affected country under this provision must be allowed to appear at a public hearing associated with the SIP revision. Section 115C provides the reciprocity requirement. It limits the applicability of Section 115 to countries that provide the US with quote unquote, essentially the same rights as those given to the other countries by Section 115. And that 
really is it for section 115. That's basically what the whole section is. There is another provision, D, which doesn't really matter in, in the current context. So there are, in essence, two requirements that must be satisfied to trigger section 115. EPA must make an endangerment finding, and it must make a reciprocity determination. If these criteria are met, then EPA directs states where pollution sources are located to revise their SIPs to control that pollution so as to prevent endangerment. It is broad language conferring on EPA ample discretion to employ this familiar SIP process to address emerging air pollution problems with international implications. The endangerment finding is a slam dunk. Right? EPA has already made the endangerment finding for greenhouse gas emissions and found that climate change endangers public health and welfare in the United States. As the extensive reports from the IPCC make clear, this is equally true in other countries. And because greenhouse gases mingle in the atmosphere, there's no question that it is emissions, that emissions in the United States contribute to the foreign endangerment. And given the United States' current and historic responsibility for emissions, there's also no question that the U.S. contribution is a significant one. These are the welfare effects, health and welfare. Reciprocity is arguably a little bit trickier, in part because it has never really been tested. Yet while any number of bilateral and multilateral agreements between the U.S. and other countries would satisfy the reciprocity requirement, the Paris Agreement goes further than anything before, instituting a truly global approach to addressing the climate change problem. Stepping back, Section 115's reciprocity requirement mandates that a foreign country provide the U.S. with quote-unquote essentially the same rights as those that are given to those other countries by Section 115. The only right conferred on the other countries by Section 115 is the opportunity to appear at a public hearing during the SIP revision process. The enhanced transparency framework uh, that included in the Paris Agreement far surpasses mere appearance at a public hearing. The details of the new framework are to be developed at a future UNFCCC meeting, but the basi basic outline makes clear how much more is involved. Importantly, the new framework does away with the existing distinction between developed and developing countries, so that China and the United States will undergo the same review procedures. Moreover, the process involves significant amount of dialogue. Countries will communicate successive emissions reduction commitments, including information about the domestic measures that implement those commitments. Other countries will have multiple opportunities to review and have input on those emissions reduction commitments, both before and after they are submitted. Now, while the statute only explicitly confers a participatory kind of right to appear at a public hearing, it's not unreasonable to infer that reciprocity also requires that the polluted in-country provide for the reduction of pollution inside its borders that endangers health or welfare in the United States, a kind of substantive reciprocity. This map illustrates that nearly every nation on Earth has submitted a pledge to address greenhouse gas emissions in one way or another. The, the NDC process moving forward will involve nations submitting future pledges and plans, and it is precisely this type of international cooperation that Section 115 anticipates. Okay, so once we have endangerment and reciprocity, what about implementation? Well, at least in the abstract, implementation will be re relatively straightforward. Given the broad discretion conferred on EPA through the statute, the agency has a good deal of leeway in deciding exactly how to go about addressing foreign endangerment. First, EPA can use the national goal set forth by the U.S. in its INDC as an aggregate national limit for greenhouse gases. This aggregate limit can then shift over the course of time as the U.S. nationally determined contribution ratchets up its ambition. Second, EPA can then apportion emissions allowances to the states based on any number of different methodologies. This could include ordering an equal percentage reduction among the states. It could base allowances on the marginal costs of reducing emissions in given states uh, or some combination of these or other approaches. Finally, if some states opt out of the SIP revision, 
refuse to respond to the SIP call, EPA can implement a federal Section 115 implementation plan. This is the same FIP authority that EPA has under Section 110 of the Act. Now, there are a number of important policy advantages to regulation under Section 115. First, the approach offers economic and administrative efficiencies. Section 115, as I've said, operates through Section 110. Section 110 explicitly allows for market-based programs, such as emissions trading schemes. Accordingly, Section 115 can achieve the market efficiencies trading programs and other market-based approaches provide. In addition, under the current approach, EPA must promulgate new source performance standards and Section 111D targets for other stationary sources, such as chemical plants, oil refineries, and so on. Under Section 115, EPA can address multiple sources, multiple rulemakings at once, creating administrative efficiencies that will benefit the agency, the states, and the regulated community. Second, EPA, Section 115 is not limited in the same way that other provisions of the Act are. The broad language grants EPA the discretion to allow states to participate in emissions trading scheme that is nationwide, that includes multiple sectors, that can incorporate transportation fuels and natural gas, and even mobile sources. Indeed, the provision allows the agency to basically marshal its authority um, to work with the states to find the best and most effective and most efficient solution to the greenhouse gas emissions problem, rather than directing it to make source-specific determinations such as best system of emissions reduction and best available control technology that are then fixed and locked in place. This approach maximizes flexibility for the states and for industry. Individual states can develop programs to achieve their allowances in the same way that they can under their SIP power, using whatever mix of measures and programs suit it best. Last but not least, Section 115 provides a legal backstop to the new source performance standards and the Clean Power Plan. Now, I am of the view that these regulations can and should survive judicial scrutiny, and I am hopeful that they will. But Section 115, by its express terms, authorizes EPA to reduce emissions from sources that are endangering health and welfare in other countries. All of the sources that are covered under these new rules, and all of the sources that are covered under the proposed rules, and all of the sources that are covered under rules that are not even proposed yet but are somewhere in the pipeline, fall into this category. This should give EPA, the states, and industry a higher degree of regulatory certainty. If these particular decisions fall, there's other authority to accomplish the same ends. So our paper was released uh, a little bit over a month ago. And in the time since then, there have been some responses, most of them quite positive, but several of them raising important legal questions. Um, I'll, now I plan to briefly address several of the most visible ones, um, and I'm sure we'll have time to talk about these a little bit more later. So the first. EPA has not used Section 115 before, so why can it use it now? I have two different responses to this. One, EPA has in fact considered using, using Section 115 in the past to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. In a 2008 advance notice of proposed rulemaking, the agency solicited comment on whether it could or should use this provision for this particular purpose. <laughs> Several entities, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, thought that this was a good idea and submitted comments to that effect. But the agency ultimately decided not to take this approach. There may have been any number of reasons that it did so, but the reason that it gave was that Section 115 could only apply to criteria pollutants regulated under the NAAQS program. This is a misinterpretation of the statute. The plain language of the Clean Air Act allows EPA to regulate non-criteria pollutants through the SIP process. The Supreme Court perceived this uh, in its opinion in Connecticut versus AEP. And in fact, EPA and the states are doing this right now. This is how the PSD requirements upheld in the UARG case are actually being implemented. Two, several of the comments on the advance notice of public rulemaking, of proposed rulemaking, noted that reciprocity requires a coordinated effort to effectively address climate change before it could be invoked. Now, while I would argue with the way that these comments were phrased, the Paris Agreement really is a game changer in this regard. 
establishing global reciprocity that is both procedural and substantive in nature. So some have argued that reciprocity requires other nations to have enforceable laws that are on the books that ensure that the Paris Agreement is implemented before the US can take action under Section 115. There is nothing in the language of Section 115 that requires this. And it would be wholly reasonable for EPA to conclude that the coordinated international effort reflected in the Paris Agreement constitutes provision of quote unquote essentially the same rights that the US is giving to other countries. To the extent that the world fails to live up to its promises, Section 115 preserves for EPA the ability to withdraw its determinations and change course. Now, the last two arguments um, are really the, were really the subject of this morning's panel, or some of the talks on this morning's panel, and I'll address them together, uh, because they're versions of the same concern. In essence, this concern is that a nationwide cross-sectoral market-based approach under Section 115 would exceed EPA's authority under the Act. This would either be because it disrupts uh, the statutory scheme, which provides for either harm-based or technology-based standards to address different types of pollutants from different types of sources, or because EPA would be making a power grab that, a power grab that would effectively make it the regulator of the entire U.S. economy. The short answer to this question, or to these arguments, is that the approach that I have sketched here today is nothing more than what the statute says on its face. And EPA taking action under Section 115 is plainly consistent with the charge contained in that provision. This is not an elephant in a mouse hole. As a colleague of mine likes to say, this is a round peg in a round hole. Or perhaps it's an elephant in an elephant hole. The idea of regulation of greenhouse gases under Section 115 does not detract in any way from EPA's authority to issue other regulations, including the new source performance standards or the Clean Power Plan. It does, however, provide a way for EPA to coordinate its authority and to integrate these numerous uh, regulatory efforts. Regulation under Section 115 also does not expand the agency's authority beyond what the statute provides. EPA would have at its discretion the ability to regulate sources that are already covered under the Clean Air Act, for instance. So what it really does is it gives EPA a mechanism to more efficiently and more effectively take the concerted and comprehensive action necessary to tackle climate change. Now, oddly enough, I have proof that this is true. Two weeks ago, Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania introduced a bill to repeal Section 115. Nothing could speak more powerfully to how on point this provision is than the attempt by a politician who questions the science of climate change to get rid of it altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering if in addition to the, um, the scientific reasons for um, using Section 115 now, if you thought that uh, sort of the political reasons, the intransigence of Congress and, and um, you know, different regulations being stopped in the court also would be um, a good reason for, for this to happen now. So like, as I said, I think that the Clean Power Plan is on firm legal ground and should survive judicial scrutiny. But Section 115, in, in, in my view, does provide a legal backstop in the worst case scenario, which is that the EPA's regulations do fail. Um, it does provide EPA with the authority to regulate emissions that are causing harm in other countries. So the, it does have that power. In terms of the timing now, um, you know, I think that the Paris Agreement really does put Section 115 in a place that was, is different than it was before, at least in terms of perception. There were concerns that were voiced during the uh, 2008 advance notice of proposed rulemaking notice and comment period that there were a number of comments that really honed in on this issue of reciprocity. The US can't take unilateral action under Section 115. To the extent that that was a concern then, it's clearly not a, con it's clearly not a concern now. Um, I had a question about this kind of new I don't know if this is on. Uh, uh, something that we've seen 
starting, I think, in the Brown and Williamson case, but also then in the King v. Burwell with this idea of something that's too big, too important. Um, what you're talking about with interpreting 115 sounds, um, it would be huge, and it would ch tie American law to international law in a way that seems like it hasn't been done before. Do you worry that, that this doctrine of something that's too big to be done by an agency, um, that kind of theory of interpretation would threaten any action under 115? Of course. I, th I mean, that's the, that's the big argument. And undoubtedly, if EPA uh, were to take this approach, there would be litigation that would say exactly that. They're doing it with the Clean Power Plan. Uh, they did it with PSD. Uh, and they will do it with, with Section 115. That being said, I think that to a large extent, it's going to depend on how EPA would approach its rulemaking. There's nothing in using Section 115 that requires EPA to make any type of power grab or to start to regulate sources that are not already regulated or would not otherwise be regulated under the Clean Air Act. That was the condition in UARG, right? In UARG, the Supreme Court upheld the ability to use that provision in order to regulate some, power some sources, but not those that are not already regulated. So there's a clear line there. And EPA does not have to transgress that line under Section 115. The states, because this operates through the state implementation program or the state implementation plan process, states would have a great deal of flexibility to do what they already do under SIPs, which is to reach sources that EPA would otherwise not try to, try to reach. So it does create additional flexibility for the states. It doesn't require EPA to go beyond the clear bounds of its authority. Um, that being said, I mean, this is the, th this elephant in the mouse hole um, using old authority to go beyond is the, is the argument that most frequently is raised in these, in regards to this provision. Oh, and let me, let me just have one more response, one more uh, piece of this answer. It is the plain language of the statute as well, right? So the question of EPA's authority the statute says on its face that where there's endangerment and where there's reciprocity, EPA can order the states to reduce emissions from the sources. This is not a best system of emissions reductions and how do you calculate it type of question. This is on the face of the statute, the power that's given to EPA to use its authority to tackle foreign endangerment. Um, thanks. I had a quick two-part question. Uh, the first is uh, related to what she was just saying is are there other regulatory frameworks that involve international reciprocity on other topics? Um, and if so, is that helped or hurt? And also, um, why was this section put in the law in the first place? Was there something specific they had in mind? Um, and if so, why wasn't it used for that for a long time? But just mainly the, the reason it was there. Okay. So in regards to whether there are similar provisions elsewhere, Section 310 of the Clean Water Act has a similar uh, international water pollution provision that has never been used or interpreted by the courts either. Um, so there's not a whole lot of, of use there. In terms of the, the, or, the origins of Section 115, uh, it was originally Section 105 of the, of the Clean Air Act, and it was first put into the act in 1965. Um, and I've taken a look at the legislative history that goes around that. And it's really quite interesting what was going on at the time. So there are, there are two storylines that go along here. One story is that one primary concern was Canada and air pollution in the United States having particular types of impacts on Canada. And that that was a concern that was present in Congress's mind in adopting this uh, provision. The other is that in 1965, LBJ and Congress were already well aware of climate change, of carbon dioxide pollution having global climatic effects as well as local climatic effects. Um, and that that was a issue that was talked about in the course of talking about this bill um, and was very much front and center on LBJ's agenda in the months leading up to passage of this bill. So, you know, to the extent that one, a lawyer can always use legislative history to pick and choose, uh, I think that there are, there's, there's ample evidence to support the claim that, the, that Congress enacted this provision in order to address air pollution with foreign impacts. Um, interestingly, there is an argument that some raised that Section 115 properly is interpreted to apply only to Canada and Mexico, and that it really is just about the neighboring nations. But Congress didn't say neighboring countries, it said foreign countries. 
And there's a big distinction between foreign countries and neighboring countries. So if you're interpreting the act based on the plain language of the act, you're looking at air pollution that endangers any nation that's a foreign nation and not just those that are on our borders. Thanks. Um, I was wondering what you sort of thought EPA would need to feel comfortable taking a step like this in terms of what ha have you had conversations with EPA or with others in the environmental community about what sort of framework you need to lay, a groundwork you need to lay to get EPA to act in this way? Um, that's a very good question, and I, I don't know that I have a great answer. Um, certainly, I would not expect EPA to be doing anything on this now, um, given the duration left in the Obama administration and where the Clean Power Plan and new source performance standards are in the courts. Um, I wouldn't expect to see anything in the immediate future. That being said, I think that some degree of socialization to the concept um, greater comfort in the legal defensibility of using Section 115 and sort of, I guess, internalizing the idea that this may provide um, a mechanism to establish a nationwide cross-sectoral cap-and-trade program um, to, sit in, to sink in. Once that, once that really sinks in, I think that, that hopefully that would be enough to get EPA interested and motivated to, to act on it. This is not a fully fleshed out question, but maybe you can help me through it as well. Uh, one topic I'm not sure I heard you discuss in the presentation, um, sovereign immunity and, you know, in terms of the interplay between the reciprocity and that potential problem. Um, and specifically, you know, if I understand correctly, not just United States sovereign immunity, but maybe state sovereign immunity, if it becomes an issue of uh, going directly to a SIP call, um, does that make any sense, and do you foresee any kind of concern there if there's a, a reciprocity problem there? Well, if the, if the concern is the concern that the international standard somehow directly applies to the states? The, the essentially the same language, I guess, in 115C. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just foresee there being enormous debate, of course, over, well, it's essentially the same adequate on, based on such and such a country or claim, and how that then affects you know, a state that, say, opposes a SIP call being imposed on it, if that's the frame. Oh, I, I see. With. I see. Well, you know, so the, the language of the statute says essentially the same rights that are provided in Section 115. So it's not essentially the same rights that are um, realized by, this, by the foreign country in the course of a state going through the SIP process. Section 115 allows the foreign country the ability to comment on a state's revision. Now, the, the Paris Agreement and the Enhanced Transparency Framework sets up a system through which countries are commenting, are, are both receiving the plans and pledges and commenting on the adequacy of those plans and pledges to a far more extensive degree than issue, writing a comment or making a statement at a public hearing. So I think that, um, no, I guess that I don't see that as a particular concern. In addition, if a state were to opt out of the SIP call, the federal government would still step in with a federal implementation plan, and undoubtedly, um, they would provide the opportunity for comment uh, on on the FIP. Thanks. Does anybody have time for one more question, Taylor? Are sure? Thank you so much for for speaking to us today. Um, I was just wondering, given that our symposium topic today about innovation is fairly optimistic, but some of the climate data is maybe not so optimistic, um, but you found sort of a viable solution maybe to some of our problems. So I was just wondering, in your role, especially with the Climate Center, are you generally optimistic about the state of sort of climate change law or not so much? And just your views on that. Thanks. Uh, oh, wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, an honest answer. Um, am I optimistic about the state of climate change law? Um, Yes, I think, I, I think so. I think that climate change law is developing in positive trajectories um, and that we're seeing more and more um, legal frameworks develop. I think the Paris Agreement was huge. Uh, I think enactment of the Clean Power Plan is, was huge. Um, the fuel efficiency standards are huge. These are all, these are all very, very positive developments uh, in, in the law. There's a tremendous amount more that needs to be done in order for us to really get on the pathway to deep decarbonization and a negative carbon economy. Um, 
and that's going to take a lot, a lot of effort over a lot of time, and it's not limited to the law, right? I mean, this is economics, technology, and everything else. Um, but I think that you know, for, for the students in the room and for the lawyers in the room, this is, this is the work that we have to do. 